everyone. I'm Susan Koshi, Director of the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory, and I'm very glad to welcome you back to the series with our lecture on queer theory. As always, we have folks joining us from across the country and a very warm welcome to all of you. For this lecture, we're going to be using the same format that we have in the past, and we will be shifting to a Q&A midway through the talk, and Professor Metzger during that period, Professor Metzger has um, a short video that he'd like us to watch. And as soon as you're done watching, come back in and we will um, start the Q&A. And then he'll continue and complete his lecture. And then we'll follow up at the end with a second round of questions and responses. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please use the Q&A tab rather than the chat to enter your questions in there. Um, the Q&A sessions will be moderated by my colleague, Fiona No, who is Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and Asian American Studies here at UIUC. Thank you for moderating this event, Fiona. I am delighted to introduce Sean Metzger, who is a professor in the School of Theater, Film and Television at UCLA and works at the intersections of Asian American, Caribbean and Chinese film performance and sexuality studies. His first book, Chinese Looks, Fashion, Performance, Race, came out through Indiana University Press in 2014. And it demonstrates how aesthetics, gender, politics, economics, and race are interwoven through particular forms of dress in what Metzger calls the Sino-American interface from the late 19th through the early 21st centuries. His second book, The Chinese Atlantic, Seascapes and the Theatricality of Globalization, came out just this year, and it complicates discourses of globalization through an examination of aesthetic objects and practices situated in cities from Shanghai to Cape Town. He has co-edited four volumes and published more than 50 articles and reviews in various print and online venues. His current book project elaborates his research on Asian American theater. Professor Metzger holds a PhD in theater, 20th century performance and culture, an MA in comparative literature, and a BA in humanities and psychology. Um, so a very warm welcome to Sean Metzger, and I'm going to hand it over to him now. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much, Susan, for that lovely introduction. It's actually a real pleasure to be at, uh, with you all, because Susan and I have known for decades now, but she was, I met her first when I was a graduate student, and she was a very, uh, uh, well, slightly younger professor than she is now. <laughs> and you and I have also known for almost as, as much time. And part of my, what I want to talk about today is scholarly networks and how they work. And it's really, I feel very in, um, grateful to be in a place where I am recognizing my own network that's been so formative to me. So thank you again. Um, I also want to thank uh, those folks, Sam and Sarah, who are in the background helping with tech issues today. I'm going to share my screen with you because I'm going to give you a PowerPoint. Um, so let me do that. Okay. Oops. I was going to not have you look at me, but I guess you can look at my dog instead. Okay, so I've um, you've just given you some of the work that I've done over the years in case you feel like following up. My email is here if you have questions that linger after today's uh, lecture. Um, I also have most of my work is on academia.edu, although I'm probably four or five years out of date now, so I will eventually update that. But if you, if I mention something and you want a copy, please let me know and I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, today we're going to talk about queer theory and I'm going to start with a specific genealogy of that term. But before we do that, I just wanted to go through the objectives for today's lecture. Um, for me, the animating questions are um, 
what is queer theory. So hopefully that by the time we finish this today, if you don't know what that is yet, you will by the time we finish. And then what are some genealogies of queer that might be useful in helping you understand that term. I have constellated a group of essays from the same journal and that was quite intentional so, because I'm interested in how, again, how certain networks produce knowledge formation. So I've taken all the essays for today's uh, presentation from GLQ and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that particular venue helped launch or helped iterate a certain kind of queer studies. And I'd like us to think about that in, in, in the terms of building an archive and what does it mean to build an archive and what's excluded from that archive. And then my focus today, I mean, queer theory is quite a large, capacious term that encompasses many different iterations of, of theories and kind of subfields. So what I wanted to think through today with you was how does queer travel? And most of my work in queer theory, as you may have noticed from the previous slide, is at the intersections of Asian and Asian American and queerness. So it's that constellation that usually interests me. My last book has a particular heavy emphasis, heavy emphasis on the Caribbean. And the last chapter is concerns South African cultural production. So I've been thinking about South African film quite a lot, and there's been quite a few South African queer films that have made the rounds internationally in the last few years. So I decided that I was going to organize the direction of queer travel towards South Africa, because I'm interested in doing some work in that area. However, I'm hoping that the, the notion of how queer travels will be useful to you wherever you might be citing your research specifically. So again, these are the four questions that I'm hoping will animate today's talk and will give you something to think through as you move to your seminars in, in the next, uh, following, the, following the talk. So I wanna start with queer genealogies and mine are specific as I think everyone's are. And I'm going to start with what is sometimes called the white queer genealogy as opposed to queer of color critique. Part of the reason to do that is because it's probably the most officially documented version of how queer theory emerged. And I want to think about that dominant narrative and then contestations to that narrative. Part of the reason that narrative is important to me is because I live through some of the events that produce or that queer theory responded to. Uh, I was an undergraduate in the early 90s during the height of the AIDS crisis. And a lot of queer theory, I think, addressed that social issue in different kinds of ways. The two people on the right of the slide, the middle one is Teresa de Laretis, and the bottom one is Judith Butler, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Teresa was my professor for a while. I did many um, seminars with her. She was a professor of history of consciousness. And for our purposes, she's someone who was a feminist film scholar who worked in semiotics. And one of her projects as she moved into queer theory was to bring together Foucault with psychoanalysis. So her book, The Practice of Love, that was published in 1994 was instrumental, I think, in furthering that, um, that particular iteration of psychoanalysis. It also happened to have the unfortunate, um, I guess, timing of landing at a moment when people were refuting or repudiating psychoanalysis as a methodology. So the, one of the responses to her book ended up kind of really shifting directions, um, whereas uh, psychoanal psychoanalytically inflected theories had been very popular through the late 70s and through the 80s into the early 90s. In the mid 90s, that started to shift. So I want to talk a little bit about that as well. She founded a queer theory conference in 1990 at UC Santa Cruz. And the results of that conference or the proceedings from that conference were produced in differences uh, in 1991. So that's one, and she, when she did that, she claimed a kind of ownership of queer theory, arguing that basically she had inaugurated the field with the conference and the uh, academic documentation. If that seems pretentious, I wanted just to say that, you know, there, I, I come in a line of scholars, um, but the, my, my sort of generation are people who ended up applying things and thinking about intersections. Whereas I think the generation before me had a real sense of ownership, like they were doing things for the first time. So, you know, the first 
lesbian film theorist. And you know, a lot of people had these kinds of claims that are not possible in later generations. And Therese is one of those people, she was very important in, in feminist theory and film theory and semiotics, but in, in especially in bringing those two things together. Uh, she also, just as an FYI, she is a person who taught herself German so she could read all of Freud, that is all 26 or whatever volumes, in the original German. So this is a very, very uh, rigorous scholar. And when she figured something out, she often would say, well, I figured this out, so you get to you know, play with it, but I have figured out how the mechanics work. Um, her kind of not really nemesis, but like, you know, another competing feminist scholar at the time, not competing, maybe a complementary, but they went in direction directions, was Judith Butler. And Judith Butler wrote Gender Trouble uh, in the 80s, and it was published in 1998, which had a, a real impact on the field of feminism um, writ large. And there, in a way, it introduced a different kind of model, a different kind of way of thinking about the stages of feminism um, that were that had been, you know, if we think of first wave feminism, second wave feminism, some people say that Butler articulated a third wave. Um, and again, in any case, she also theorized queer, but differently. So I gave you in the middle here, Teresa de Lourdes's imagination of what queer would be, and it was really a way to re-signify gay and lesbian, to think about how those terms are homogenized and how you might introduce counter narratives into what had become relatively sort of dominant discourse um, and a representational discourse that assumed certain things about subjects. So she was interested in undoing that, that um, kind of notion of gay and lesbian attached to a specific kind of subject. Her thinking in that regard didn't really at the time include bisexuality or trans or a lot of the other iterations we've come to associate with queerness at the time. And in the background of her theorizing, there was the politics on the ground of ACT UP, the um, uh, AIDS Coalition to Unleash, Unleash Power. And that group, uh, if you know the story of the normal heart, you know that Larry Kramer founded that group as a split from the gay men's health crisis that was trying to advocate for more attention from the government to find cures for HIV and AIDS. So De Laredes would say I was not aware of those politics happening. I was just thinking about specifically gay and lesbian politics from the point of identification. So all this is happening. And then in 1991, David Halperin, who's another uh, queer scholar, was approached to edit GLQ. And that inaugural issue launched in 1993 and included essays by two prominent scholars at the time, Judith Butler and Eve Sedgwick. Eve Sedgwick, her work was on shame at that, um, in that volume. And we're, we, I gave you the piece that but Butler published, Critically Queer. And Critically Queer moves in a different direction than, than the psychoanalytic paradigm that Teresa had been using. And that's important to Mark because it helps explain why there's such a discussion of psychoanalysis when you get toward, toward, towards the end of the essay, critical queer, critically queer. Of course, we could have done this differently and I could have given you a different genealogy and that would have gone through Aja Lord, Gloria Anzaldua and Shuri Moraga. Um, and I did not do that specifically, again, because I think what's traveled internationally is not the queer of color critique that's largely based in American intersectional politics. Um, so I didn't do that because I wanted to point to how more abstracted theories that were less grounded in the U.S., the particularities of U.S. politics managed to travel abroad. That said, uh, it's worth noting that this is just one version of this story. So Critically Queer, published in 1993, argues that it follows what is called ordinary language philosophy. So ordinary language philosophy is interested in how, as it sounds, ordinary language affects things in the world. And the, one, the piece that gets um, most cited is uh, about performativity. It's J.L. Austin's How to Do Things with Words. But he's in the company of other, of other scholars as well, like Wittgenstein and others. Um, almost everyone just cites Austin, so I'm just gonna pick up where Austin um, starts speaking about performativity, because that's where Butler picks up. So Butler argues that performative acts are forms of authoritative speech, and that power acts as discourse. So this is a very well-known formulation, and I think it's probably the most cited um, piece of Butler's oeuvre, which is quite extensive now. 
And the implications of her looking toward performative, performativity was that rather than thinking about subjects or agents that precede discourse, she argued that there is no power construed as a subject that acts, only a re reiterated acting that is power in its persistence and instability. So in other words, there's no I behind a discourse that's an agent of something. The agent is always being produced by the discourse. Um, and so that was very important and also made a, that made a sort of huge turn in how people thought about the politics of feminism at the moment and the politics of queer, because a lot of those, those kind of discourses routed back to the notion that you had an agential subject that would do something. And in, that, in the place of that idea, Butler offers something different. And she, she insists that the discursive condition of social recognition precedes and conditions the formation of any subject. So you can't be a subject that acts without being embedded in some sort of discourse. And your capacity to act is always um, predicated on the idea that you're reiterating a discourse that precedes you. So her example is the judge, right? So like when a judge announces something in the law, there's a, they're citing precedent. So judges cite precedent, which is a form of discourse that gives them authority and actually achieves some results in the material world. In this regard, um, Butler argues that queer emerges as a kind of interpolation. So I know you read Marx before. I didn't see Althusser on your list, but nevertheless, Marx and Althusser suggest that interpolation is a process by which ideology produces a subject. So in other words, as you can see in the cartoon, when a police officer addresses you, says, hey, you, and if you turn around, then you recognize yourself as a subject of the law. That's why you're turning around. And so in doing that, you acknowledge that you're a subject within the system. We can think of other ways of dealing with that um, kind of phenomenon be it through nationalism or some other kind of large ideological structure. Of course, Marx thought that the, the chief ideological structure was uh, the ruling class imposing ideas of their class on, um, the working, on the working people. She then moves on into uh, queer trouble. And in her queer trouble section, she argues for iterability. So she, she notes that the performative accumulates the force of authority through repetition or citation of a prior authoritative set of practices. Again, this is just a reiteration of how the judges, um, how judges produce effects in the world by reciting the law. Um, the notion of queer then is a way of sort of uh, interrupting that iterative process, right? So queer has the potential to destabilize this iterative process because if, if you have a system that's continually iterating and telling you, for example, who you are, it's within the kind of continual compulsion to repeat that you could maybe interrupt the process and make it produce differently. Um, more specifically, she argued, at least in this essay, that queering might signal specifically into the realm of gay and lesbian politics uh, a different way of thinking about the formation of homosexualities and the way that you might misappropriate the power that um, terms like queer enjoy. So rather than queer being thought of as denigrating, sort of reappropriating it and thinking about what else it might do if you um, shift context. So divine is also a good example of that in sort of material practice for me. The next part of the essay goes to gender performativity and drag, and that reading is partly to correct the public's readings of gender trouble that was produced in 1990. So she, Butler had talked about drag in 1990 as an example, and a lot of people lifted it out and said, well, obviously, if you're talking about drag, you're talking about choice. And so she wanted to correct that and say, actually, no, gender is not a choice. So gender is performative insofar as the effect of a regulatory regime. So that is to say that it's not that you get to pick your gender, it's that you, gender knows you. So once you understand the conventions that would label you in a particular way as gendered, usually as male or female, you can re-signify that process. And that's what she says drag queens are doing. So they're re-signifying the process that normalizes male and female. So that we don't, normally we don't think of male and female as being produced categories, according to Butler. And when you look at a drag queen, you do. Um, because they make the process of repetition visible. In this, insofar as the process becomes visible, it's theatrical. So it mimes and renders hyperbolic, that is exaggerated, the conventions that it's um, citing. 
Uh, and so this is also what ACT UP did, right? So ACT UP did a lot of very theatrical practices like die-ins and things. And it was meant to, call, um, to, rather than to just normalize the death of gay and lesbian people, for example, from um, HIV, uh, the die-in would, would remind people like, oh, this process is something that you could stop, for example. Um, the, as the essay moves towards conclusion, Butler shifts back to melancholia and the limits of performance. So melancholia reminds, it's a psychoanalytic term that comes out of Freud's essay, Mourning and Melancholia. Melancholia is basically a continuous and neurotic meaning. So neuroses as opposed to psychoses means that there's repression involved, right? So you're not conscious of what's happening. So there is a continuous attachment to a lost object. Whereas when you mourn something, usually you mourn that thing um, and you move past, right? And that's sort of a healthy psychic trajectory, according to Freud. So melancholia has a kind of attachment to something that's lost that you can't let go of. So from this, um, Butler reminds us that, okay, so psychoanalysis is not fully useless. So she says, one of the things that psychoanalysis reminds us is that when you think of the unconscious, it means that there's limits to what the psyche can exteriorize or what we can express or what we can know about ourselves, right? So this is a kind of fundamental, if you, if you think, um, premise of psychoanalysis. And we can never know ourselves fully. That's why you have to sit on the couch after all. So the, the idea is that um, those kind of psychoanalysis is also useful for showing you certain kinds of processes that might otherwise be obscured to your conscious knowledge. One of the questions she has is, well, how do you resolve these two things? And so rather than think about um, the psychic, psychic formation as such, she says, well, let's think about the norms that condition how we understand our psychic processes, for example. So where she, I think, feels that psych psychoanalysis as a whole was um, to put too much emphasis on your, to inter, 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 sorry, interiority. Um, and she says one of the, the, the interesting things about drags is it, it makes you reflect on the interior, exterior, exterior binary in a different kind of way and actually exposes the binary as such so that you can understand that that thing is just a construction that we've, we sort of established that we have drawn on. Um, for her then, straight sexuality helps to maintain gender norms um, by disavowing the possibility of same-sex desire. So again, the sort of lost object is like if you, if we can't let go of this attachment to same-sex desire, then what, what are the consequences of that? And for her, it, it causes a cultural kind of um, continual production of heterosexuality to mask the fact that we have never dealt with this idea that we could have same-sex love. Um, the last section of the essay uh, moves to performatively generally. Um, and she returns to, in the very end to another thing that she discussed in, in Gender Trouble, uh, Paris is Burning, which is about the um, um, ballroom scene in New York in the late, in the, in the 80s. Um, so her notion was that if people are citing things um, dramatically, that is making you aware of processes of the way that processes become normalized as things, then um, a, a sign like drag can make you aware of the kind of demand of, of, of the cultural demands through which certain things become legible and then certain things become illegible. So again, she's trying to call attention to the process. So performativity as a kind of iterative process in the, um, that we don't always see becomes quite apparent when you see someone hyperbolically um, repeating something, as in hyperbolically repeating gender norms that we might associate with fabulous um, screen divas or something. Um, so in this way, she's also trying to address something that had come up in feminist theory, and that was the separation between gender and sexuality, right? So if those two are discrete terms, how do they nevertheless co-produce one another? That was one of the sort of issues that she had to contend with, because a lot of people if, um, felt that if queer theory was going to tend, at that time anyway, mostly to sexuality, how does it come back to gender? Um, and for her, it does that, she, she does that by moving back to the ballroom scene in New York, specifically by thinking about the ways that kinship gets reconfigured. So in the citation of a family unit, for example, uh, the, the sort of leader of the, of the house is known as mother, right? So reconfiguring kinship relations is one way that this um, process might work. Okay, so that's um, a quick overview of Critically Queer. And before we move, um, to a discussion, I just want to quickly go over uh, Neville Hode's piece. 
uh, between the white man's burden and the white man's disease. And uh, the picture here is from Cape Town Pride in 2012, just to show you what normative, sex how normative sexuality or normative kinds of, of marks of sexuality um, travel. But he's specifically thinking about human rights because one of the uh, kind of concerns about Butler's work was that, well, it's so discursive. What about you know, people on the ground? What about things like human rights discourse, which is designed precisely, ostensibly, to protect those people who are vulnerable, those populations who are vulnerable? Um, so Hode says, uh, and this should remind you of performativity, international discourse not only names, but also produces different identity categories under which one could seek protect, uh, protection. So for example, the boys here or elsewhere could claim like, well, I, I'm being harassed for being gay, for example, and so I need to seek legal protection. Um, so this brings up questions of like, well, how is same-sex desire understood in a particular cultural context? And Hode goes on to, to investigate, well, if, if there are norms like this that are kind of filtering into the country as a human rights discourse, what is the, and that, that suggesting that there's a kind of universal human subject that is being protected, what kinds of cultural nativist discourses might challenge that? And how do they complicate that kind of um, the notion that there's one subject sort of all over the world? Um, in this regard, Hode says that sexual orientation does not map onto the specific practices in particular cultural locales. So in other words, when you move in human rights discourse that tries to recognize gay and lesbian subjects as such, one of the things that, it ca that, cannot, that elides or eclipses is whatever local practices are happening that may or may not be legible within a gay and lesbian uh, framework. And he gives the example of several African terms that might be seen as equivalent but are not exactly the equivalent of uh, Western words like homosexual or gay. Okay, and then um, he moves on to talk about South African particularity. So how does one address those kinds of contradictions? And just to summarize those, that list of interventions, uh, Southern Africa as a whole has a belated kind of post-colonial relationship, right? So most of, uh, many of the countries, at least three of them, have quite late arrivals to post-colonial status. So they have a very long legacy of settler colonialism, which he notes is, well, that's bad on the one hand, but on the other hand, it also makes them quite attuned to Western discourses. So to say, for example, that an international human rights discourse is not South African is not exactly accurate. He also notes that there's a superficial sameness to commercial gay life. And we can think of this as there's a kind of queer global that's being transmitted. And that is why I picked the slide in the, um, this slide here. It's because, you know, the gay pride events look very similar when you move to different locations around the world. Um, and then he says apartheid is, um, the notion of tradition has been used both to resist apartheid and also um, been attached to sort of think through how you can empower cultural groups that emerge out of the end of apartheid. So um, there's a, again, he's interested in the contradictory relationships that a lot of the, that a lot of the discourses in South Africa um, have had on the populations there. Because there has always been a human rights tradition in South Africa, as he notes, at least from the apartheid era on. But that human rights struggle, he further notes, was not a civil rights struggle. So he says, when you try to map on US racial politics in South Africa or US sexual politics, you, there's um, a mismatch. Because in South Africa, of course, the minority was in power. So when you think about minority rights in South Africa, you're talking about the white minority, uh, which is generally not the, um, the group that you want to privilege in uh, post-apartheid South Africa. So ultimately, he argues that what you get from all of these discourses is a really a com com kind of competing notions back and forth that produce, that sometimes converge in surprising ways. So for example, he says that progressive and conservative groups both appeal to discourses of nation, um, sort of outside the, appeal to discourses outside the nation of South Africa. Um, and one, so for, for uh, sexuality group, it's like protect, you know, people from corrective rape, for example. Um, because that's what everyone else around the world is doing. And at the same time, people, the same sort of uh, um, more local groups are saying, well, in Africa, for example, homosexuality is not a thing. It's not a colonial import. So in other words, they're both appealing to discourses that um, exceed the space of the nation state in order to make cases for their particular, particular pol political positions they want. And that has partly to do with the kinds of globalization processes that have happened in, in um, 
well, in the last several hundred years, actually. So we can think of economics as a kind of globalization, but he also mentions Christianity, so religion being a figure for globalization, and AIDS, which would be pandemic, right? So pandemic is a figure that brings global communities together, as we see for sure right now. So I wanted to, to put these two, com two um, pieces into conversation, um, the Hode and the Butler first, because they set up kind of different trajectories of the way queer theory would go. And, you know, Butler herself argued like, oh, I'm, I'm not fully accounting for race. She doesn't at all attend to um, discourses outside of a Euro-American framework, which is kind of interesting. Um, but she is also, her first book is on Hegel, so that might make sense. She's, she, you know, she comes out of a philosophy, philosophical tradition that believes in universal human subjects. And a lot of the queer theory work that comes after is really trying to challenge that notion. Okay, so what I had in mind is that you would spend five or six minutes, you don't have to get all the way to the 15, just looking at this video clip. The group is called um, Pink Money. And it's just about, uh, it's, it takes place in a club, so it should be fun. There's uh, music and stuff. Um, but just take a look at it really quickly and come back, and then we'll do Q&A for this first section. Thank you. Um, Sean, could you add the link yeah. to the chat? I think some people might not have gotten oh, sure. it. Yeah, thank you. There you go. 
Fiona is going to reconvene us. Is that correct? Um, yeah, Fiona should come on. And then are you ready to start the Q&A? Um, oh, sure. Sean? Yeah, whenever. OK. I still think with the uh, film playing from the link, there's about uh, um, uh, two minutes left, I think. Oh, is that? I'm not in a hurry. I just wanted to make okay. sure, because I have no way of knowing that. <laughs> I just, just wanted to make sure. So should we just wait for the two minutes, Fiona? Would that be better? Yeah. Yeah, this is what uh, Mike is saying in the uh, sure. cool. Thanks. In the chat as well. OK, great. Perfect. 
Um, Sean, I think we have the first question in the chat, actually, um, not the Q&A, in, in case you'd like to just take a look at it. Sure. Uh, do you want me to answer it now? Or <laughs> Fiona, do you want to read it out? It's actually in the chat. Sure. Yeah, I see it there. Uh, so the question, Sean, is uh, from Liz Moreno. Uh, I was wondering what kind of response has been given from queer theory to radical feminists who criticize the foundation of the concept of gender? So I think that's quite a, I mean, it's a good question, a broad question. I think a lot of radical feminists consider themselves are also queer theorists. So I think those two things are not um, so easily to disarticulate. But, uh, I think there's a convergence in a lot of third wave feminism and queer theory in terms of thinking through like, well, if um, we don't accept that a notion of essential or constructed is viable because they both of those positions still assume a core of gender, then what other ways do we have to know um, um, the, the processes of gendering? And I think a lot of people come at that through different angles. I mean, obviously a lot of folks have come through Butler and think, thought about kind of discursive norms, but other people, um, I'm going to forget her name from Brown, who does uh, does um, uh, kind of uh, medical studies and sexuality. Um, who is what's her name? Uh, Sexing the body is that book? Who, who wrote that book? I, anyway, I can't think of now. But but people who um, uh, not Caroline, but someone. Else, um, hmm. Anyway, so, but there are other people who are, who are thinking through different formations. So what does it mean, for example, that if you look at the sort of ways we normalize gender in the medical profession, that there's a certain percentage, uh, not an insignificant percentage of people who don't, who don't fall um, into either male or female defined hormonally and also in terms of secondary sexual characteristics. So if we have this huge, um, so Anne Foster Sterling, thank you. Yes, so Anne Foster Sterling you know, has done quite a lot of work in that regard. And her, her um, I mean, she's also interested in normativity, but she's much more interested in how that sort of registers at a very material level with very specific consequences in a specific field. Whereas I think Butler is a bit more abstract in thinking about sort of gender normativity um, writ large and often abstracted from it from I mean the critique from materialists is always that you, you're so abstracted from the material circumstances that it's really hard to initiate any kind of political movement if we assume that political movements need to resolve or cohere around some sort of subject position even if we recognize that subject position position doesn't need to be a person um, you still need a positionality from which to speak in which to affect change in a system. And I think a lot of, uh, so like another person I work with, Sue Ellen Case, is always, you know, always um, sort of babbling with, with Butler's ideas for that reason, because a, a materialist feminism often wants a, a just a more grounded, a more, uh, not necessarily empirical, but at least um, something that manifests more concretely in terms of, of um, the social conditions that people, in which people actually live. And, is that addressable simply by thinking about how norms are being produced discursively? I think it remains a good question. Thank you for that. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, we have another question uh, written into the Q&A box uh, from Angela Ting. In light of the global pandemic and the suspension of mass gatherings that make up an essential part of LGBT life, how does queer nightlife club culture figure into the performativity of queerness and gender? All right, well, there's, I think there's a whole subfield now of, of sort of queer nightlife. Um, Jose Menos did a, a text on that, but there's a lot, and a lot of people in dance and performance studies have looked at club culture uh, specifically. And I think part of that, uh, and I think we can link club culture also to ballroom culture and other places where people tran transform for a duration of time. And then when they leave that space, they um, transform back into a different kind of, or perform a different kind of identification. So I think um, a lot of, uh, a lot of work is done in that area to, to think about not only, uh, I guess, the, how norms work, but also how long they endure for. So temporality becomes a very significant question in that sort of subfield, um, as does space. So I think those two things that Butler doesn't really address specifically, you know, she doesn't really tell you like, well, 
you know, how long is, for example, how long does it matter how long someone is in drag for, or those kinds of questions? Um, does it matter what kind of space you're occupying when you're in drag for subcultural reasons or whatever, for, in terms of identification? Um, those kinds of things fall out of her paradigm. And I think a lot of the nightlife work helps you parse more specifically how do space and time matter for specific populations and specific constituencies. And also the possibility to imagine certain kinds of politics and affiliations with, um, with across groups or just um, by creating groups that you wouldn't find in normative sort of cultural, cultural um, regimes. Um, how COVID affects that is like another question entirely, and I'm not sure I have the answer to that. I can just say that I think um, I think of pen, the pandemic now as another figure for globalization, and it's uh, but it's different than the one we think of in terms of just economics, right? So there's um, a reason to. I guess, reconfigure the global through the pandemic. And it's, there's this moment to remind me of like, oh, there are other moments when this has been kind of an organizing force across international boundaries. So HIV and AIDS is another one of those. But again, the kind of organizational structure for that in terms of preventing HIV and AIDS infections has, um, um, I, I mean, like in South Africa's case, has, has had it like produce very, very contradictory kinds of responses. So on the one hand, you have a lot of a, a, like a higher incidence of people doing corrective corrective rape and things like that in order to sort of cure themselves. On the other hand, you have a lot of, of sort of appeal to international health organizations to challenge the government, at least during um, uh, some of South Africa's recent governments, I mean, HIV was not acknowledged at all. So there's a kind of a different kind of way of accessing discourses beyond um, that are queer, but they queer when they come back to South Africa, they're, they're queered in a different way, right? Because the population, it's not only the LGBTQ population being affected by that kind of pandemic in that space. So I think one of the things that we'll see with this pandemic is also it creates new kinds of affiliations and also kinds of new new antagonisms. So for Trump, obviously, it's like the Chinese, you know, Ch Chinese virus, so, or the China virus. So I think that also, um, hooks into a sort of a sort of larger yellow peril discourse that's also historically um, um, specific but reactivated in this moment of pandemic. Great. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, we have another question that's come in very recently from Blair Winter. The question is, how do academics theorize about culturally specifically gender and queer studies uh, that diverge dramatically from uh, democratic in uh, square, scare quotes societies. I'm thinking specifically about conservative religious societies or people living under dictatorships where uh, th they may not be attuned to or may reject uh, Western discourses. Hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, it obviously depends on the case, right? So I think that there's, again, a lot of scholars work in this in different ways. I'm more familiar with people who work on Asia in this vein. But so let's take, and Ng Benglin has done interesting work on Singapore. And one of the arguments is that, you know, on the one hand, Singapore has a quite repressive government apparatus, right, to structure daily life. Um, on the other, which was not open initially to um, non-heterosexual um, public uh, social formations. And then the Singapore being Singapore, you know, recognize, oh, the pink, the pink dollar or the, the kind of economy of pink tourism had a lot, of, could benefit the nation state um, in interesting ways. So uh, they take a very contradictory stance in, on, on the one hand, sort of policing certain forms of social engagement, at the same time, also encouraging uh, at, the, at a kind of an uh, at a, sort of a macro level, like, oh, we want investment from companies that are doing LGB, that will attract LGBTQ business dollars into the economy. And I think, um, I mean, obviously, because Singapore is an advanced capitalist society, I think it would look different if you, with a, in a very multicultural society. It would look very different if you're looking at a place that's much more homogenous or where there are certain um, um, conventional or normative structures that um, prohibit same-sex sexuality. So we could think of um, different kinds of religious spaces, including those in the US that do restrict that kind of expression. Um, and I think in that case, 
queer theory, again, the, the specificity of it, I think, I think a lot of us who are, have continued with queer theory do it because, oh, there are norms, but we want to think about how the norms work in very particular places and in very particular times. And I think that's how it can be very useful to thinking through the, the particular. Great. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, and thank you, uh, Blair Winter, for your question. We have another question that's come in from uh, Dee Dee Ruggles. Um, who writes, so often we talk about queer theory in social, psychoanalytic, cultural, and political terms. Um, how is, is uh, capital, capital also a regulatory force on sexuality and identity? And I think if I might um, just tie this too to the video we just watched um, about pink money um, as a sort of monetization of a kind of global queer culture, um, as you're so, sort of also talking about um, uh, pink dollars uh, in Singapore. Um, if you could tie that to, together in a few short sentences about global capital. Thank you, Fiona, for, for reminding me that I actually asked you to look at something and did not talk about it. <laughs> Very helpful. I think, you know, a lot of, actually, a lot of the faculty at UIUC deal with the, the effects of um, capitalism on um, queerness. So, um, but that said, I think there, I mean, there's a, there is a, there's a huge body of work on capitalism and globalization and sexuality and what that does. In terms of the video, one of the things I, th I mean, there it's meant, their performance is meant to be a kind of critique of how um, pink money produces a certain kind of legibility and there are costs to that kind of legibility, right? So one of the things that they can do is travel and you, you um, attract, people become more knowledgeable about their situation in South Africa. For, potentially, but it also involves um, kind of radical awareness of class differentiation that happens not just within the country, but also from um, one, like a tourist to a, another person. And also there's all kinds of cultural fetishism that gets talked about as the video proceeds. So I think, um, and the fetishism is not just understood kind of uh, in terms of identitarian manners or in a psychoanalytic way, it's also understood as just like literally a commodity fetish. Like how can we capitalize, as Fiona suggested, on certain iterations of queer difference. Um, and uh, this is probably sort of best illustrated in, in the uh, independent queer cinema, right? Where there's always trying to find a new story of the people who have not yet been represented. Um, but that's also a way of saying like, we can capitalize on your difference. Thanks for that. Great. Uh, thank you, Sean, for your answer. Um, I know I made it uh, impossibly large. As, as it were. Um, we don't have a question right now, Sean. So I was wondering if we might take this moment to, uh, one, congratulate you on your new book, um, The Chinese Atlantic. Um, I was wondering if you might uh, be able to just uh, tell people what the new project uh, is about. And uh, if you could just to relate it to, you know, how you're thinking about queer theory at this point. The Chinese Atlantic project or the next one? No, the Chinese um, yeah. You know, for me, I think one of the, someone, well, I was doing a talk like this once and one of the graduate students said, oh, I, re I read your work and I, I find it interesting, your sexuality is often not at the forefront of your analysis, which is true. Like it's often, I mean, I think it, and, he, and then he said, well, but you, your writing has a kind of queer sensibility, which I kind of like as a thing, because it's true that I think, I think my work is largely wow. informed by queer theory and sexuality studies. And sometimes I do engage it very directly, but often, I mean, quite often it's uh, subordinated to principal terms like race or other kinds of, of difference. Um, so in this case, that was, that happened because I, I was interested in how Chineseness circulates in the Atlantic and what it might do to Black Atlantic studies. Um, Black Atlantic being seen as the cradle of capitalism, right? So if, and, and nowadays everyone's looking at China and saying like, oh, well, there's like this new, new sort of capitalist force in the world. And so part of it was to offer an alternative history of capitalism that, that place China much more closer to the center of, of how um, capitalism emerges. Um, but also then to think through like, well, what, what happens to a lot of the assumptions in Black Atlantic if you, if you think about the pop Chinese populations that have been in South Africa and the Caribbean historically for a very long time. Um, and then also think through, well, there's new ways of investment coming now. So like Jamaica and places, you know, a lot of their infrastructure is now being built by Chinese loans. So it was that the project was designed to think through those issues. And it happened that the case studies that I was looking at, um, which was often sort of 
I was guided by the artists in each place, they would tell me like, I mean, it, I mean the, the work they would, they would kind of focus me towards was not queer. I mean, it was very, very, you know, heteronormative in a lot of ways. And I was interested in that because I think the queer part gives me a, a queer theory gives me a way of thinking about well, what's at stake in reproductivity generally. Um, and the kind of maintenance of, for example, diasporic structures of Chineseness. So people keep claiming family. And um, what does that mean in this space? And in some ways, like in one of the case studies, uh, this filmmaker who's quite wealthy, you know, was able to literally reestablish a kind of historical link from Jamaica to Harlem to China because she had the capital to do that. Um, and I'm sort of interested in that link. And it, was, and it was all done through, literally through kinship ties, but very normative kinship ties. And I think one way, one of the things that queer theory does for me in that instance is, is ask, well, how can we understand kinship differently? I and mean, this is to take one of Butler's provocations, right? Or what does the normalizing of kinship relations do um, to make us understand cultural production and um, diaspora uh, in, a, in kind of new ways? So uh, the project goes all over the place. It has lots of case studies in it. Um, but I think, I guess the queer parts are, are more, they're in those moments and then also in the moments when I sort of, there's a slight ethnographic piece in this book because I had to switch um, methodologies because my, my archival kind of research and stuff did not, did not work for me. So as it failed, I need to find something else. And so when I, and when I start interviewing people, people always, I mean, they know I'm gay already. So it's like, you have to, that enters that sort of equation right away for me. <laughs> Um, I can't imagine why. So, anyway, that's no, a brief answer. Um, but I, this is project actually the South African cinema stuff. I've been I'm teaching on South African cinema now too, and it's partly. I mean, when I first got there, there was so little that I was that I could find, and so just when I, since I had spent, you know, it takes a long time to get there, so I would be there for several weeks at a time. Um, and the easiest people to introduce me to myself too were other queer folks. So it's that sort of, I started this sort of like sub project on queer stuff because that was sort of the sort of baseline for my, for my contacts, my ethnographic work. Yeah. Yeah, no, sensible. Thank you so much for um, sharing more about your work, Sean. I appreciate it. Um, we have a load of questions coming in uh, as people are formulating them. Uh, the next question comes from Amber Scarborough. Uh, who asked, could you discuss how you think queer theory and post-colonial theory are interacting with one another? Um, I know at issue, as you mentioned, um, has, been, uh, has been a Eurocentric Western approach. Uh, what is being done to counter this? So the next six slides actually answer that or provide one response to that question. So I'm gonna hold off on that and then um, maybe come back to it at the end of that, uh, presenting that material, because I think it will help um, help elucidate those, those issues. Right. Um, the next is uh, related to the earlier question. Um, and I think um, after these two questions, we will go back to your presentation, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the first is a follow up. It's uh, from Blair Winter, who asks, how can the economic power of pink dollars be harnessed without the dangers of pink washing? Right. Okay. You know, the, the thing about um, kind of material enactments of, of activism, you know, I used to work in social services. And one of the um, reasons I left social services was because I felt like you had to make too many compromises and you couldn't think through, I and mean, there were so many immediate needs in front of you, you couldn't think long term about the systems and the kinds of exclusions or violences they perpetuated. So I'm not sure that I have a good answer for this, I'm only to say that um, I think even the best meaning sort of interventions often are contradictory and they produce um, sort of help for populations as much as they produce violence against them. Um, and that's probably always true of LGBT sort of activism in some way because, because it's such a constellation and this is to fold in the next question on interdisciplinarity you're folding in so many different communities, right? So, and when you, when we do LGBTQ plus or LGBTQIA plus, you know, whatever letters we assemble, they're never 
equal participants or equal representations in, in, in that rubric. And so even the very sort of naming of the community, however we want to name that community, is also inflicting violence on people who are excluded and are not represented in, in a particular um, sort of action or iteration. So I think, and of course in mainstream politics, this happens all the time. So you subordinate, uh, um, as we have seen, we have subordinated certain kinds of concerns to make, um, to make some sort of advance, right? Um, uh, so I'm sure not everyone wanted Biden, for example, but certainly people were willing to subordinate their, their, their kind of um, conflicts in order to eliminate the person that they really did not want. So I think these kinds of choices are things you make all the time when you're trying to actually enact in the world um, material change. Um, but I, I also think that uh, queer theory and LGBTIQ plus studies is useful because it, it makes us attend to how we normalize certain populations and processes um, and reminds us maybe there's a different way to do things, uh, or at least there's a hope that we can do things or produce differently. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Sean. Uh, last question uh, before we move back to uh, presentation uh, comes from Alexis Webb, who asks, do you think queer theory is inherently interdisciplinary um, has that had any effect on those within the LBGTQ plus community and the complexity uh, to the performativities portrayed unto them? I think, I think yes. Thank you for that. I think, yes, it has. And the reason is because I think right now we're in a moment like all my students are, you know, they identify with pronouns first. They're very, I know part of it is just, you know, like they're, like they're, they're woke. And I'm not sure what woke means in actual politics necessarily, but certainly they know a lot more discourses um, at a sort of popular level or populist level than were sort of floating in the air in the early 90s. I think that people have a much better sense of like, oh, like gender could at least could be on a continuum and I could understand these different iterations of that. That is very different than, you know, when I was growing up for sure. And I think, um, I mean, when you can even get my like 83 year old mother to recognize that there's like gender is a continuum, not a static like entity. I think that's there's some sort of progress and that only comes because, I mean, she's not a literary theorist or, you know, a queer theorist, she's, but she does, you know, watch TV and certainly, they, you know, these things have like permeated the culture in different kinds of ways. So for whatever that might be worth. All right. Fantastic, Sean. Uh, I think that's it for questions for now. We can okay. Uh, um, I'm going to go through, I mean, I had planned to do this in two, and I, the second part was going to be shorter, um, so don't worry. <laughs> um, and because uh, I, 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 I don't like to assign things and then not talk about them, so I had in mind that I would get through everything. So if I go faster, it's because of I want to, I'm going to go through everything, <laughs> um, if it kills me. So then in order of GLQ sort of publication, Tinsley's essay came next, and it was um, Black Atlantic, Queer Atlantic, to revisit the kind of separation that had happened between critical race studies or critical race theory and queer theory, which had been the bastion of whiteness in a lot of ways. And this is not, I mean, by the time she's writing in 2008, there were a lot of interventions in terms of uh, race and queerness. Um, and again, many of the people at UIUC, including Fiona, Amy, and others, you know, were, and, uh, you know, were instrumental in furthering this kind of project. Um, in her view, I think one of the things that she does differently, that is Tinsley does differently, is that she's interested in a kind of historiographic view, right? So she, like a lot of Atlantic studies, she moves in, um, retrospectively looking back at different possibilities for there to emerge a kind of uh, queer formations. And her example is the Mati or, or from Shipmate, right? That you could feel the people in whatever you, way you'd like, but also that you have a feeling for the people who share experience for you. So it's affective and also a kind of a tangible material um, sexuality. Um, for me, this essay is interesting because it, it um, works in the Caribbean space, which her, book, her first book was also on the Caribbean. Uh, and it, uh, that there's a lot of uh, institutionalized homophobia in the Caribbean space, not that there's not elsewhere, but certainly it's, it's very pronounced in, in Caribbean studies. And actually, I think that's where it's different. So it's on the ground and also in the academic field, uh, homophobia, that is. Um, so she promises to move beyond metaphor in her essay, and I'm not sure she quite does that, but I like the, the kind of provocation to think of queer uh, as a kind of way of resisting, that is a kind of marking of 
of the violence of normative ways of thinking. Um, and I think that's important to think through, not just in terms of uh, reg registers of sexuality and gender, but also in terms of race and how often race gets conflated with, or the sort of possibilities for racial futures is always predicated or often predicated on uh, reproduction, heterosexual reproduction. <clears throat> Um, and she, of course, joins several others in, in, in noting that early queer theory really did neglect race in a lot of substantive ways, even though, you know, Butler manages to, to put in one little bit about like, well, the field might change if, you, if we took this seriously. <clears throat> I suppose I should also say, this is one of the things I find interesting about a previous generation, whereas I think now people doing work have a lot more trouble sort of not doing intersectional analyses. I think that is, a, I'm, again, a relatively recent phenomenon in the last 30 years that that's happened. A lot of people, um, a lot of the sort of senior scholars in, in queer theory didn't do race at all, or they would you know, write these books and there'd be one chapter or one example on that was racialized. Um, in, in Tinsley's sort of work, the literature becomes um, the kind of the, the thing that produces possibility, right? So because she's looking at artistic forms that, that work through the imagination, and which I also, of course, do, but through performance and film. But I like this, the notion that you can re-narrate, obviously, with the literary in ways that uh, other fields um, may not be so easy to sort of manipulate in this way. Um, I, I mean, she also asked it to turn the material to water. And since I just did this whole thing on the Chinese Atlantic, I'm interested in the water and how, how we look at seascapes and the kinds of connections um, that are facilitated through the sea, not just um, the ships in sort of Gilroy's model, but also the kind of rhizomatic stuff that, um, that um, uh, Glissant takes from, from um, the Liz and Guattari, that those kinds of sort of networks. And you know, if you if you actually travel in the Caribbean, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of mangrove forests, and mangroves have you know a, a lateral root system that's just a shallow, shallow root system that's just under the water. And a lot of Lisson's theories really take, I was gonna say take root. Um, they take root in you know literally from from his observation, empirical observations about the mangroves. So I think there's something useful about looking to a particular case study that provokes the imagination in a certain direction and often against sort of the, the sort of normative or dominant trend in queer theory. <clears throat> the person who asked about post-colonial theory, um, I think her, the concerns are directly addressed in Anjali Arandakar and Gita Patel's uh, joint issue called Area Impossible. That was really to pick up on the African stuff that Neville and Hode had done, was trying to think about geopolitics differently so that geopolitics would actually change the epistemology of how queer theory works, not just provide another example. So, you know, anthropology often, the, the model in sexuality studies look like, well, here's a different kind of sexual or gender formation in this other place. Um, but it didn't change the, our analytic for understanding gender or sexuality from the beginning. So I think they're arguing for, well, if we look, if we take area studies seriously um, and its intersection with queer theory, might it enable us to rethink the, the Western biases in our own um, models of understanding. And so we can think of this, again, we could bring up like the notion of the universal subject again, you know, and that's challenged in many different places. But also the idea of the national, you know, which has been kind of more or less stable, at least in Western Europe and the US for a while and the Northern Hemisphere, um, is quite contested in other places. So they're taking up Kashmir as a space, you know, contested by India, Pakistan and China is an important example in that regard. Um, and it asks us to think of well, how do people negotiate different cultural contexts and what might the possibilities for desire be when they're routed through one or more of those um, national or cultural descriptors or multiple, uh, multiple um, national or cultural descriptors. Uh, they also are interested in literature, but that's partly because both Anjali and Gita are uh, literary scholars. Uh, and they are interested specifically in the fable or the fabular. So, you know, and I think that's a useful thing because it's, a, it's sort of fables are outside of time, right? Or that they, they have a different kind of temporality than um, more traditional narratives or buildings from Mon or whatever. Uh, so I think that they offer you a way to imagine <clears throat> differently, which I think is the project of a lot of queer theory is to imagine differently when we start to conflate interdisciplinary fields. Um, this is a, a very text-heavy slide, I apologize for that, but I just wanted to reiterate their sort of how 
a queer area of studies might work. And they see it as a kind of heuristic practices that um, see form as a placeholder that might express either multiple or nonsensical desires, or at least nonsensical from the paradigm we have to look through it, um, whose content continues to be under erasure. That is, we, we like look at certain kinds of populations and we don't know um, how to read them. So uh, a good example of this is I'll come to when we get to the Africa sex article that I'll end with. Um, but uh, there are a lot of kind of sexual categories that do not necessarily neatly correspond to um, our Western notions. Um, and that part has to do with material conditions. So for example, when we think of Tongzhi discourse in China, I mean, Tongzhi comes from that word in Chinese means comrade, right? So it's an appropriation of a communist discourse meant to, to then to name a kind of same sex relationship. Um, but how that relationship um, at, uh, works within a culture that at the time was very invested in national reproductivity and, and a one child rule is very complicated. So I think, at least from, from my um, perspective, which I know Chinese studies better, you know, this is a uh, one, one kind of iteration of sexuality we can think of taking shape in very particular ways. Also, like in Hong Kong, you know, everyone lives with their parents. So even on the ground, like the notion of coming out becomes much more complicated in that kind of context when you can't just divorce yourself from your family unit and from uh, filial obligation. So in that regard, they say we need to um, broaden our understanding of empire, meaning like not just uh, the physical manifestations of empire, but the ideologies that come with the circulation of American-centric notions of, of sexuality, of coming out, and, and the kind of capitalist enterprises that, that follow that. So, you know, the neoliberal idea that you, you know, you, your personhood is, is sort of enabled the more money you have and the more you can give to the causes you like, et cetera. Um, secondarily, they say, or the second point is that they say, you know, we should understand race differently. And I've tried to do this in my own work. It's hard. I'm also running a group right now that thinks, well, okay, so every place that we could go in the world has a kind of different racial formation. And we might generalize about some through, I mean, we can think of Anista Silva or people who have done work to say like, well, race has a certain kind of operation, at least from the Enlightenment forward, if not even before. Um, that's about differentiating personhood from non-person. So we can think in those terms, but when it gets enacted on the ground or in a particular place, then you need a more textured or nuanced model that might account for how race is manifesting or how it's understood. So South Africa is useful for me in this regard because, for example, the Chinese population was racialized very differently under the apartheid regime. So they were labeled uh, as colored at one time, as Asian, which is usually reserved for the South Asian group in South Africa, which is a historically a lot, much larger minority um, than Chinese folks. And then um, in at least one case, a Chinese person uh, petitioned the government to be labeled as white because according to apartheid rules, they would have to move to a different township if they were not categorized as white. And then after apartheid ended, uh, Chinese folks, a group of Chinese folks, petitioned the government to be labeled black because they felt they wanted the reparations that were being allotted to black populations. They had also suffered under apartheid and they felt that they were entitled to reparations as well. So anyway, race means different things at different, in different places at different times. And then lastly, how do we create epistemologies um, through citational cultures that are not sort of overdetermined by kind of our US or, or British frameworks. And Anjali is really, really good at this, and Gita too, actually. But um, Anjali wrote a very interesting book called Without a Trace on the History of uh, Sexuality that looks at archives very differently, like actually approach the archive of sexuality really differently. And as a kind of a teaser, you know, one of the, the provocations I love about her, her that um, that her work in that regard is, as England was disseminating cultural products like Shakespeare all over the world, it was importing uh, things from the colonies, things like rubber and dildos, um, which we do not talk about so much, but actually give you a very different look at how cultural transaction and translation work. Sorry I'm speaking quickly, but I'm trying to get through everything before we're finished. Um, Okay, so then the last piece I gave you was to, to kind of end back in uh, uh, South Africa specifically, um, although I'm looking at Africa generally um, in this article. Um, and I think, again, to, to think through how queer theory and post-colonial theory might work together and hear, you know, what is, what is usable from the past that might um, 
help articulate queer theory differently for African sexual subjects, if you want to sort of group all Africans together, which I suggest we do not. But we can even say South African sexual subjects, how would that be different than, for example, North African subjects, where you have I mean, religious difference obviously matters dramatically when you're looking at either end of the continent. Um, so their notion was to take you know, customary law, which was in South Africa during apartheid, was recognized as, you know, when they, when the apartheid government gave uh, um, black South African groups uh, autonomy in non-desirable spaces in the country, uh, those groups were allowed to retain some of their customary laws, that is their tribal laws or whatever. Um, and one of the interesting things that's come up is those customary laws are often used precisely to police now the idea that uh, there could be queer iterations of sexuality or queer iterations of gender um, uh, in their societies. So, so there's, on the one hand, it, it gives you a sort of vocabulary for thinking like, oh, well, how does, does um, custom facilitate, again, a denigration of a certain kind of personhood? And then also, how does custom law recognize completely different categories of person? So for example, those, those um, places where there's male, female, and then the third category of gender that has a different role in the social structure. Um, so that kind of, of idea of like how we would mobilize queer theory differently in a particular context. And that brings me to a film that recently came out called The Wound. Um, and this was, it was very controversial in South Africa because when it came out, it was, um, uh, Banned, and it's it depicts a kind of a kosa ritual. I can't click, so sorry. I'm going to say kosa wrong, but you know, uh, a kosa ritual um, um, where people are going through a circumcision ritual, and that's supposed to be not something that you share with outsiders. So there's a film about this that shares the ritual. It also happens that this film is about kind of coming into coming of of. of into sexual awareness of the protagonist who's featured here. So the ostensible ban was because of the ritual, but then a lot of people said, well, you're banning it because it's also portraying a, um, sexual practices that you don't want to, that, that, that people don't want to believe are indigenous African. So that both sides ended up um, kind of having a battle over this quite publicly. Um, and I think one of the things that the article says that's interesting is, one of the one even the maintenance of that ritual as a customary ritual is being is not just a heteronormative uh, ritual because one of the things that it enables is it puts men together in a place where they can also have sex with each other without anyone else knowing so and that's clear in the film so that the the idea of re-signifying how that ritual um, performs a certain kind of masculinity and manhood becomes important and in in the film and then also became important in the culture because a lot of people were arguing about it um, so that, that notion that you wouldn't necessarily have a kind of out gay identity in the world, um, but you might have other spaces that enable you to have same sex relations, um, sort of underneath the sort of a heteronormative appearance of the society, I think is important to remember. And it's a one, inter one, one direction queer theory can productively go. Um, so they end up saying, we want to take the, basically the global south and marry it or divorce it from the global north. So to think both like what are the conjunctions that might be useful and also what are the differences or where are things specific or particular that need to be rendered more nuanced for us just to understand how queer might generate meaning in a particular place at a particular time. And that is the whole thing. Thanks. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Sean. You covered so much in such a quick amount of time. We still have about uh, eight minutes left uh, of the uh, seminar or talk. Uh, if people have uh, questions to post to the Q&A, um, that would be great. Give people a, a second, Sean, to catch up with you. I know. I had to catch up with myself. I was speaking quickly. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for people, Sean, I was wondering um, if you might comment on how you uh, 
have come upon this next project, the project on uh, cinema in Africa. And, and so it was, it was really, how, yeah. how are you thinking of Africa as a, as a space, since it's obviously quite varied, so. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, I'm really doing South Africa specifically, and it was, it's really, this is a more of an article length piece, but it was partly because to recognize and, and validate that, I mean, that my context when I was navigating South Africa, I would not have been able to do it without the people on the ground. And it was interesting, every time I went, it would be a sort of different host. So, and I think because of South Africa's history of segregation, like one trip, I was almost entirely with the colored population, which is, uh, was a legal category under apartheid. So there's, you know, townships are built as, you know, colored townships as opposed to black townships for white townships. Um, and um, a lot of, I wanted to, and a lot of them, I mean, we needed, we needed some access points. So one of the things they, they sort of taught me as I was there was like, oh, well, if you want to think about, you know, representations of X, you should look at this film. So I started that way. And I thought, well, I'm here, I might as well just look at the archives too. So I contacted the person who was doing the film festival for it was called the, the Out in Africa Film Festival and ran for several years, uh, and it put me in contact with um, the org the lead organizer, and it reminded me of I had worked on um, uh, one of my projects on futures of Chinese cinema. I was also thinking about film distribution and festivals, so it was, it was sort of like a way of of thinking through that together. And also, a lot of the artworks I was looking at were installations that involved film, so I there was sort of that conflation, and people kept asking me to to like I did a talk at the museum there. Um, so I had to learn more about the medium and that sort of led me to think, well, I actually have something to say about this sort of last wave of, of queer films that just come out. Partly because a lot of them, you know, are, are white because Africa under the apartheid regime, uh, or sorry, the post-apartheid regime, film studios have a uh, like language you get money based on if you're, if you're working in a particular language. So Afrikaans counts. So where you wouldn't think there would be a lot of Afrikaans cultural production, there actually is in the film, in the film world. And that community already had a lot of money. So they're actually leading film production in South Africa independently. Hmm. Well, fascinating, Sean. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we have a comment and a question, a uh, comment from uh, Dee Dee Ruggles, who writes, she has no further questions. But just wanted to say that this was a great model for how to teach queer theory, covering its history, politics, and on the ground in multiple areas. Um, so well done. Uh, we have another question uh, from Joel Cole, who writes, was wondering if you could say more about GLQ in terms of producing an archive of queerness, uh, of ways of knowing queerness, and how this relates to some of the geopolitical concerns in the articles they read. Thank you for that. Um, I think, you know, GLQ was, it from, has been informative in helping to shape the world because it's given an outlet to various iterations of queer theory and also people who wanted to split off from that. So I think Transgender Quarterly kind of became a split off of, of GLQ because GLQ wasn't accommodating the interests um, in a field that was that in transgender studies, which was growing and growing and growing as it's sort of in its own right. So I think one of the things that, uh, and GLQ itself was a kind of corrective to, for example, the Journal of Homosexuality. Journal of Homosexuality has been a long running uh, journal that tended to focus on more empirical research, a lot more kind of um, non, less theoretical social science research and that kind of things. Um, but all, I mean, they do other kinds of work as well. But I think, um, I mean, as the term would suggest, they have a kind of a broader interest in sexuality studies, period. I think GLQ, you know, if I were to, to say what it's missing, I mean, it, it has taken onto its board people who are attempting to like, for example, expand the temporal parameters of the material it covers. So Carolyn Dinshaw served with Robert Halpern when they were first editors. Carolyn Dinshaw is a you know, medievalist, if you don't know. Um, but it was still very, it was very Western. And so I think that they, they slowly realized that. And so even I think by their fifth or sixth issue, they were thinking like, oh, we should make this more transnational. Uh, but the push for that is difficult when, when legibility in a field, I mean, I'm a general editor myself. So I know like, you know, you're expecting certain people to come with knowledge of certain kinds of scholarly conventions and conversations. So it's difficult to open up like, um, oh, also, and you have to publish in English. So this is another issue, right? So if you want to really be transnational, 
doing it in one language is hard. And all of the terms have to be translated into English, which of course privileges a Euro-American kind of worldview. So I think that GLQ was um, recognized that it was doing that. Nevertheless, supported projects that were really just tr trying to think against its own sort of internal norms or interior logic that was being manifested. Um, and different editors have done different jobs with that, with that project. But I think it gives you a sort of sense of how the field expanded from the mainstream, which is to say like, if we think of a mainstream LGBTQ politics from the moment it was inaugurated in the 90s, being quite white, you see the same transformation in the journal, like they're trying to um, expand what, what the capaciousness of the term queer, right? Um, and I think David Halpern in, a, in the 20th anniversary, he said like, oh, you know, we, we established the editorial board and it was only 20% white gay men. <laughs> like, is that something you should be proud of, really? Like, I don't think, you know, like you could have a very different iteration of that kind of political statement, but that's where we were. So I think it's an interesting way to track like how the field has come and also to see for a lot of us who are, you know, who the mentors were in the field and how we have either inherited certain things from them or turned against them, <laughs> if that were the case. Great. Uh, thank you, Sean. We, I think, are more or less out of time for Q&A, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Susan. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you so much for uh, just a, a fascinating talk. Um, you covered so much ground and your questions were just really wonderfully thoughtful. Thank you so much. Um, and it was wonderful to have you here.